Good morning. I'm here with Yon A. Robinson, the founder of Reading for Smiles. And I just wanted to get some information about what Reading for Smiles is because quiet as it's kept, it's taking off. A lot of people are starting to talk about this Reading for Smiles program. So I want to find out about the origins of Reading for Smiles, the goals, what's it all about, and how does it benefit anyone at this time. So what is Reading for Smiles? Reading for Smiles is a tutorial agency that works with students in low-income neighborhoods and providing services that they might not receive during the day. We are basically an extra support to their academic success. Okay, speaking of academic success, um, how does your program relate to all of these educational changes going on, like CORE? I mean, uh, do you have any testimonials or any evidence that your program is actually benefiting people? Yes. Uh, you mean Common Core. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm not very educated, so... Because, uh, <laughs> because I'm an analyst anyway by the day, the after-school program, I know how to use that data into changing instruction for what our students need um, in, regard, in regards to learning. As far as the things that are Common Core, I think Common Core is very straightforward based um, in saying what the kids need to know. So it's our job as educators just to make sure that we cover those bases and allow children enough practice time to get those skills required. I teach the skills in this program so that students can master any assessment. The thing is, is that it doesn't matter what the test looks like. It's about whether or not the, ch the child has the necessary skill sets to move forward. Can they comprehend? Can they write? Can they critically think? Those are the things that we work on. Um, as far as what else did you just ask? Me? Um, okay, well, it was, it, was a, it was like a triple loaded question. Right, you know what? But that's good because it's gonna all things are gonna connect by the ah, end of this video. No, you asked about the students, my students' progress. Yes, I have data that should proves that my students have learned and moved forward. Last year, when Common Core was implemented on the state test, none of our students had failed this assessment. Um, everyone had actually passed, and I knew from then on we were going on the right track especially dealing with non-fictional text and things that relate back to real life. Okay, good. Speaking of real life, there's a difference in your summer program and your program that happens during the school year? Yes. So, during the summer, I teach all four content areas. We do social studies in a class called Road Trip. The kids learn about different countries. Um, the cultures there, the people there, all these different things. They read text from the area. And then we have restaurants come in that cater food to those specific countries that the kids learn about. The, we do Reader's Theater. We do a business class for the kids where they get to learn about business and financing. They make their own business commercials um, at the end of the program. And in our science class, they do hands-on experiments every day. During the school year, our key focus is literacy, but we're doing it straight through vocabulary, um, writing, and reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. So it's called Reading for Smiles because it's fun? Like, what kind of rewards do the children receive? Well, we have a different couple of things that we do. Um, the kids actually do compete against one another within our program. Um, they find it very interesting to, to, <laughs> to do that. But the whole point of Reading for Smiles is because literacy is fun, and a lot of people believe that once we start talking about a learning environment or school, that it's no longer fun or that it can't be fun, and that's not necessarily true. We're coming in an age where children have to always be engaged because school education is in competition with technology. When you have computers and laptops and tablets at people's uh, fingertips and these, fa these fancy phones, certain skills are being missed. So we have a lot of students who can go, oh, yeah, well, you know, my two-year-old is doing great on a tablet and they can do that. But there's certain key skills that teachers still need to be able to implement or at home still needs to be implemented so that kids are still learning and able to progress through their academic life. Has the demographics of your student body changed since your beginning? Because from what I understand, you started off in Queensbridge, and now you're more in a centralized location, so to speak? Yes. So when I first started, when we were 100% serving African-American students. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that was in Queensbridge. But because of the location and the space and things that were going on, we had to move. So now we're inside of our World Neighborhood Charter School, and the population here in Astoria is very mixed and very diverse. So my population now is uh, largely Tibetan and Latino children. Okay, okay, good, good. And about two to five years or even further down the road, what do you see for this program? I hope to see that we are in every borough and as well as in every major city. There's a definite need, and Common Core is not going anywhere. It was, a, it was a national initiative, which means that there are a lot of students who are struggling. There's a lot of educators and school systems that are struggling on adopting what that actually means and carrying it forward for the populations that we all serve. So I'm really hoping that we're able to expand and to keep up with the demand. We have grown tremendously this summer will be four years old and we've have already serviced more than 100 students mm -hmm. so I'm hoping in two to three years we're adding on another hundred to that load um, most of our students know we are very a family oriented program and this will always be home to many of them and a lot of parents always seek us out for the advice on how to you know better enhance their child success stories get through a conversation with teachers I've sat in on teacher parent meetings just for that purpose mm -hmm. um, just so that there's always a communication line happening and that we're closing the gaps on those who are without uh, quality education being served so speaking of quality education is this like financially prohibited is this uh, is this only for rich kids or kids from a certain background and how has your reflecting on your background at the United Nations how does that affect your approach to all of these different student bodies. So finance, we're talking about finances now. Is this affordable? And also, your background at the United Nations, does that tie in with your relations to your student body? Um, definitely. So for the financial aspect, we're a nonprofit organization for that reason. I never wanted any children that worked with me or any families, for that matter, to feel like, oh, they could never afford us which is why we are only five dollars this is probably the best education you can get for five bucks um and that's not me gloating that's me telling you ex you know exactly how it is and what we're doing here the a lot of the proceeds and stuff that we we do get is to uh buy materials that the kids need to learn or to provide them with their snacks and stuff like that so i i don't see myself ever really charging high rate prices because that's not where this program came about um, as far as my relation back to the UN, this is where I started um, the program from while I was learning there. And it was meant to be an international program. So for me to now be sitting here serving children of all ethnicities, it, it's a blessing in disguise. I thought I would be traveling the world doing things for the UN and actually the world was brought to me um, as far as serving and, and educating the youth. Okay, great, great. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Like, um, is there a period where, is there still time for um, parents to get in, get their children in, um, their children into the program, or yes, it's but close. space might is starting to get limited. So, if any parents are interested, they can send me an email at reading the number four smiles at yahoo dot com, or go to the website readingforsmiles.org. We're also on Facebook, so you can message us there, and I'll get back to you um, to let you know how that space works. We, are, we service children from 5 to 12. So this is a 501c3 organization? Yes. They can give donations and get that back in taxes? Yes. Okay, great, great. You know, that's important, you know? Well, no, it, it is, it is. And, I mean, that's to say all charitable organizations, I feel like there's enough of us out here doing grassroots work in our communities to try to make a difference. Uh, can I have the address for your PayPal link just in case there's any people who would like to support you directly? Um, they should inquire that by email first. Got you. Got you. Inquire that by email first. We Got you. We haven't set up the website yet just to take um, that, but we have taken donations that have been mailed to us. So you can also, like I said, go to the website. You'll see the address there. If you want to mail a check or a money order or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, or actually, sometimes I don't even want the money. Sometimes I want supplies. 
send me pencils, send me notebooks, send me crayons. Um, I take those type of items even more so than I take the people's money. Okay, thank you very much. So thank we're going to revisit you in a, a couple of months and see how the progress is going and see where we can improve or see if we're worthy of any praise for this uh, great endeavor. There you go with improve. Perfect. <laughs> Perfection. No. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you.